Chapter 7 Sugar, Spice, and Everything Vice Paladin didn't like games, especially when the wager was his life. Am I a gambling man? he replied, struggling to meet the steady gaze of the woman in white. I suppose so. And so your sister has said. She tilted her head, and the diamond brooch in her dark hair flashed. She offered her hand. He was sure he had seen her before, not only on the pale man Zeppelin, but also with Flora. He had an image of the two together, giggling, dressed in uniforms. But when? Paladin took her slender hand and kissed her white glove. A gentleman pirate, she cooed, smiled and dimpled her cheeks. How novel. He released her hand and cast a hard gaze at Flora, hoping she understood that one slip of his real name would get him killed. Flora cleared her throat. Karina von Gilder, allow me to introduce... Her mouth quivered with a half-suppressed laugh. My dear brother, Matthew Blank, distiller of fine spirits and smuggler extraordinaire. She whispered to the dark-haired woman. Be careful, Karina, he's a lady killer. Flora saddled next to Paladin and laced her arm through his. Matthew, meet Miss Karina von Gilder, owner of the King's Cross and practically everything else on this rock. She cupped her hand over her mouth and said, She'd be quite the catch, too. One of the richest and most beautiful women on two continents. Don't embarrass your brother, Karina said coolly. He's certainly been through enough this evening traveling to our island. That was an understatement. Paladin had fought his own brother, torched the family moonshine operation, and trod through every seedy bar in New Orleans to get to Le Cour de Minoui, Midnight's Heart. I'm sure the two of you are itching to get together, Flora said, and talk business, but give me a few moments with my brother. It's been weeks since I've seen him. Of course, Karina said. I shall await your pleasure, Mr. Blank. She glided away with effortless grace. Jack approached her, wringing his hands and bowing as if she were royalty. He held out the bottle of Black Knight bourbon for her inspection, but she ignored him. Flora grabbed Paladin's arm and led him toward the bar, brushing past Tennyson. Miss Blake, Tennyson said, startled. How good to see you again. Paladin shook his head at Tennyson. Get that limo, Tenny he murmured, minus the driver, and be ready for anything. Paladin quickly glanced around the room. All the doors were guarded. Bring the car around the back if you can swing it. Get our guns on your way out, too. Understood. Tennyson nodded to Flora and left. Flora watched him go. Tennyson, she muttered with a scowl, your ever-faithful manservant. Do you still feed him scraps from the table? She dragged Paladin to the bar and sat with a flourish of her black satin dress. She spoke French to the barkeep, and he returned with two drinks. She slid a highball glass to Paladin. Drink it, she hissed. It'll look strange if you don't. Paladin looked at the drink as if it were poison. It's only water, Flora said. I know better than to try to ply you with liquor. He took a cautious sip. What are you doing here, Flora? Her lips parted in a grin. I'm having fun. These people have money and power and aren't afraid to use them. They know how to live, unlike some men I know. She swilled the contents in her glass. What are you doing here? She whispered. Do you know how many people on this island would like to see you dead? Probably not as many as would like to kill me. He crossed his arms over his chest. I came for you, Flora. That's sweet of you, brother. But let's try the truth. What Blake Aviation Security Scheme are you running today? Matthew and I are worried about you. You're drinking, this lifestyle, and your new friends. They're more dangerous than you realize. I'm here to take you home. I see, she said, and stared into her drink. You think poor little Flora is all sugar and spice and everything vice? I hate to disappoint you, but I'm all grown up, and there's no home for me to go to. You and Dad and Matthew have seen to that. It was true. Neither of them had a real home or family anymore, but that's what Paladin was here to set straight. Now all he had to do was find a way to tell her that without sounding like a sap. He looked around the casino at Flora's friends. 
They wore designer gowns and smart tuxedos and jewels. They spoke in French and German. Opium smugglers? Moonshiners? Who were they really? His gaze landed on the dark-haired woman, Karina. She was lovely and smart and deadly. She had engineered the theft of a Lockheed prototype, almost started a war, and was the architect of a scheme that would have killed or injured hundreds of innocent bystanders. She had fooled everyone, including Paladin. Who is she? he asked. Flora drank deeply from her glass until there was only pink froth at the bottom. Karina von Gilder, I already told you. Her eyes narrowed. You really are interested in her. I wonder why. She scooted closer to Paladin and set her hand on his arm. He smelled the same overly sweet odor on her breath that filled the room. We were at Smith together. You met her in 28. Paladin visited Flora the summer before she dropped out of college. He remembered her very young and awkward girlfriend who had eyes for him. This was the same woman? The Von Gilders have real money, Flora said. They go anywhere and do anything they want. They make things happen. A gunshot rang out, less than a block away. No one noticed, or if they did, they didn't seem to care. Then again, in a city of pirates and smugglers, murder and mayhem in the street was probably normal. This place, despite its opulence, gave Paladin the creeps. Matthew thinks you're in danger, he told her. If you won't listen to me, then... Flora giggled. Poor Matthew. He must have been convinced I was in peril to even talk to you. Was he even sober when he told you about the King's Cross and the Spins Social Club? He was sober, to start with, Paladin said. You don't know your friends half as well as you think. Really? Her hand on his arm gripped tighter. Her nails, through his tuxedo, dug into his skin. And what are you going to do about it? She released him and waved the bartender over, ordering another pink margarita. You're in way over your head. She closed her eyes and whispered, Go back to Hollywood, Paladin. I'll send you a postcard and tell you how much I miss you. She looked up. Paladin searched her eyes and saw the pain in them. She'd been running away from life since their father died, killing herself. Slowly and with style, but just as sure as if she'd placed a gun to her head. You're cleaning up, Flora. Maybe not today, but I will get you out of here. She smiled and stood and smoothed out her gown. I think you better take care of whatever business you have with Karina and leave, while you're still alive. Flora, I... Karina walked across the room, her white dress trailing behind her. Mr. Blank? Shall we talk now or wait until tomorrow? There are other matters I must see to tonight. Paladin didn't want to stay in his viper's nest a second longer than he had to. My sister and I are done, he said. For now. I must take your brother, Karina said to Flora. Forgive me. Flora leaned into Paladin, kissed his cheek, and whispered, If anyone needs saving, it's not me. It'll be you. Be careful. Karina took Paladin's hand and led him from the bar. Do you prefer dice, cards, or the wheel, Mr. Blake? I thought we were discussing business, not games. Gambling is how we do business with newcomers on the Cour de Minuit, Karina said. They must prove their intellect, their resourcefulness, and their luck. Besides, all of life is a wager, no? She flashed him a dazzling smile. I never gamble with anything but my heart, Paladin said. But for you, I'll make an exception. What are we wagering? She snapped her fingers. Jack? Jack obediently stepped forward and tried to take her hand to kiss. She withdrew it. You have a sample of Mr. Blake's fine liquor? Oui, mademoiselle, Jack stammered. He gingerly handed her the square bottle of Black Knight bourbon. She took it and waved the Frenchman away. She ran her index finger on the label. I thought we would wager your cargo. If you win, I shall pay you the cash equivalent, say, 25 francs a bottle. Then we can move on to more interesting stakes. I see, 
Paladin said cautiously, unsure of just what her plan was. Cards, then. Another gunshot sounded, possibly in the street outside the casino. A few heads turned, but in moments the gamblers returned to their games, nonplussed. Karina approached the baccarat table, and with a nod of her head, the players and dealer got up and left. Paladin sat down opposite from her. She set the bottle on the green felt between them. We have met before, Mr. Blake, but I cannot quite place where and when. Her green eyes squinted slightly as if she were trying to see through them. I'm flattered, but I don't think we have. She had to remember who he was. Paladin's photo had been splashed on every paper and newsreel when he'd brought down her Unionist Zeppelin down practically on top of the Washington Memorial. So why keep up the pretense? Why did a cat play with the mouse before ripping it apart? Carino reached under the table and handed Paladin a sealed deck of cards. He opened it. They didn't look marked. He shuffled, offered her a cut, which he took. A test of luck, he dealt two cards face down. Ladies pick, high card wins. With her delicately long fingers, she flipped over a card. The eight of clubs. Paladin turned over his. The jack of diamonds. She leaned forward and her brows arched. Very good, Mr. Blake. I owe you 90,000 francs. Would you care to wager again? Sure. Paladin tossed the jack onto the table. My 300 cases and the money for information. If I win, I want to know more about the Deshpin Social Club and how a guy like me gets to join. She scooped up their cards and buried them in the deck. You appear to be a gambling man after all. She shuffled with the speed and precision of a sewing machine and then threw a card in front of Paladin and dropped one in front of herself. I will tell you this, she said. The Spin is more than a social club. As you have obviously gathered, we are an import-export enterprise. Independent operators and several national governments use us to move their products. She withdrew a business card from her long white glove and flicked it across the table. Embossed upon it was a spider web. The Spin, the spider in German, she explained. Each strand of our web extends to a different nation across North America, Europe, and even the Orient. We are everywhere. Paladin saw the spider web was bent, the strands kinked halfway from the center. We have other, more ambitious plans, of course, she added. But before I can tell you of our future, the cards. A gunshot blast echoed in the adjoining room. This time, everyone took note. Karina stood. Paladin instinctively reached for his forty-fives, which weren't there. The door to the other casino flew inward off its hinges. The judge stepped in. Tommy Gun pointed at the crowd. He glared at Paladin with his good eye. I knew it was you. Judge, Karina said in a deliberately calm tone. I hope you have an excellent explanation for this interruption, or you will walk the short plank. I've got reason enough, he pointed with the muzzle of his gun. That's Paladin Blake! Karina didn't look surprised. She turned over her card, revealing the Ace of Spades. It appears, Mr. Blake, that your luck has run out. Chapter 8 Cold Justice Paladin Blake stared down the barrel of the judge's tommy gun. There wasn't much else he could do with it pointed at his face. You've got me mistaken for my brother, Paladin said smoothly. I'm Matthew Blake. The tuxedoed men in the casino anxiously watched, but no one interfered. No one dared get in the judge's line of fire. Flora, however, giggled and ordered a bottle of Black Knight bourbon from the bartender. Karina looked at Paladin, then at the judge. Well, she poured, which is it, Paladin or Matthew Blake? Her blue eyes narrowed to slits. The judge wagged his gun at Paladin. 
I've gotten drunk with Matthew Blake. I've been shot down by Paladin Blake. And I'm telling you, this ain't Matthew. He glared with his one good eye. Flora sauntered across the room, holding her bottle by the neck and halted by the judge's side. He's right, she said, and clutched onto the judge's free arm to steady herself. Flora, no, Paladin whispered. That's my brother, she slurred. Paladin. He told me he'd break my neck if I tattled. Indeed, Karina said and looked Paladin over. It appears, Mr. Blake, that we have met before. She collected the cards on the table and squared them. And it appears that our business is not concluded after all. She balled her white-gloved hand into a fist. Judge, take him to the green room. Get the doctor. We will then have an extended conversation with our guest. Paladin didn't like the sound of that. He had to do something, but there weren't many options. He couldn't dodge the judge's aim at this range, and he was too far away to grapple with him. He could grab Karina, use her as a shield, and get mobbed by every man in the casino. Flora laughed hysterically. Brother, dearest, you are a pain in the ass, but I still adore you. She reeled back and swung her free arm, along with the bottle, and landed a blow on the back of the judge's head. Glass and liquor sprayed across the Persian rugs on the casino floor. The judge stood still, staring at Paladin. The pirate took a step forward, then collapsed in a heap. No one moved. Everyone fixed upon slender Flora, singularly elegant in her black satin dress and glimmering emeralds. The jagged bottleneck still grasped in her delicate hand as she stood over the fallen giant. Paladin broke the spell first. He stood, grabbed his chair, and threw it at the windows on the western wall. They shattered and razor-sharp shards rained onto the ground below. Men and women scattered around the room. In the confusion, Paladin ran to the ledge, skidded, and turned for Flora. She backed away. Go, she whispered, and raised a serrated bottle. You're not taking me anywhere. I belong here. Paladin had come to Le Cour de Minuit to get his sister out of the snake pit. That wasn't happening tonight. He no longer had the luxury of trying to save his sister. He had to save himself. He jumped through the broken window. Silvers of glass sliced through his tuxedo, his cheek, arms, and legs. Paladin flailed through the air, three stories, and landed on a rose hedge in the sunken garden below. He pulled free of the thorns and got his bearings. From the broken windows of the colonial mansion, people stared and pointed at him. On the rooftop, he heard the racking of machine guns. He looked for cover. There were fountains and a hedge maze. Behind him was a roar of a car engine. Paladin turned and saw a silver limousine mowing down topiary animals. The car skidded to halt next to him. Tennyson popped open the driver's door and slid over. Get in, hurry! Paladin shouldered himself behind the wheel and stomped the gas pedal to the floor. Bullets pinged off the trunk. The limo fishtailed over a fountain basin, knocked over marble planters with night-blooming magnolias, and crashed through plaster Greek statues. The wheels caught and the limo rocketed back over the topiary animals, bumped over a sidewalk, scattered pedestrians, and then screeched onto the cobblestone boulevard. Paladin smoothly accelerated toward the hills and the airport on the other side of the island. What happened to Miss Flora? Tennyson asked. Paladin gritted his teeth. Flora took out the judge by herself and bought him a split second to get away. She had saved him when he'd come to save her. He owed her one for that. He was going to return the favor and get her out of here, even if he had to straightjacket her first. Flora has her own plans, Paladin said. We'll be back for her soon enough. He glanced in the rearview mirror. There were no cars behind him on the winding road. We're home free. By the time they catch up to us, we'll be up in the air and halfway back to the mainland. Lights flashed in the mirror. Far away, but directly behind them. Paladin had to slow as he took the corners, switchbacking up the hillside road. The light, no matter which way he turned, stayed on his tail and was closing fast. 
Paladin kept one hand on the wheel, turned, and squinted into the darkness. Those lights were at the same level as their car, floating a half mile out. What the hell? Paladin muttered. That's no car, it's... Fifty caliber bullets tore into the limo's trunk and top, ripping through the velvet upholstered seat between Tennyson and Paladin, and then sprayed and sparked across the hood. A devastator thundered overhead, arced up, and banked. He's setting up for another strafing run! Paladin looked for his pistols, useless against an armored plane flying at a hundred miles an hour. They were sitting ducks in the limousine. Tennyson drew his sawed-off shotgun from his overcoat. Get out, Paladin said. Make a run for it. That's not getting through the plane's armor. Quite right, Tennyson calmly replied. This, however, may. He removed from the folds of his coat what looked like a scaled model of a rocket, two feet long with white shark teeth painted on its nose. I developed it for our boys at the Dixie Branch office. Remember they were drawing heavy ground fire at the Tallahassee airport? Tennyson slid the rocket into the truncated barrel of his shotgun. What the hell are you doing? Paladin asked incredulously. He recalled Tennyson's backwards firing rocket had almost torn the wings off the plane he had fitted them to. You've tested this? Stop the car, Tennyson said and rolled down the passenger's window. He leaned outside. The Devastator lined up on them. It dove. Over the drone of its engines, Paladin heard the thunder of its fifty calibers. When it was 300 feet distance, when the line of bullets were a heartbeat away, Tennyson fired. A streak of smoke and fire cut through the darkness and impacted with the Devastator. A split second of illumination outlined the plane. The left wing shattered and the fuselage spun off its collision course with the limousine. It tumbled to the ground, cartwheeled, and exploded. Tennyson dropped the smoldering remains of his shotgun, now little more than a twisting, smoking metal, and shook his blistered hands. Tested, he announced. A qualified success. Paladin scrutinized his friend. Tanny, I can't decide if you're crazy carrying three pounds of high explosive and launching it by hand, or if you're a genius. Genius, old chap. Paladin looked up. There were twinkling stars and clouds obscuring the moon and no more planes. There had to be an airstrip near the casino, which was probably how the Devastator had found them so fast. He'd bet there were more on the way. He stomped on the gas, and the limo jumped. Steam poured from the hood, and the gearbox rattled and ground metal. It was another mile to the airport. This car had to hold together. Paladin raced over the summit, past the fences and barbed wire protecting the anti-aircraft guns, then down the other side of the hill, through the farms and tin shacks. Soon the lights of the runway and the shadowy outlines of Zeppelins appeared on the horizon. Paladin aimed the car at the airport gate. The red and yellow striped arm of the gatehouse was down. He didn't slow. The limo crashed through the arm and then through a chain-link fence. The front tires blew, but Paladin didn't ease up on the accelerator. He struggled to steer the screeching car toward the hangars. A glance in the rearview mirror. Men ran after them, rifles drawn. There was a clank in the gearbox and a rattling. The engine revved, but there was no power to the wheels. Paladin turned hard and slid to a stop, slamming into the hangar wall. They jumped out of the battered car and ran inside. Tennyson climbed into the cockpit of his customized hoplite bumblebee. Paladin started toward his hoplite. Stopped. Tennyson, wait! There's no armor on B, and it's full of bourbon! It's the last thing we want to fly out of here! What then? Tennyson asked, and his bushy white brows arched. Paladin glanced quickly about the hangar at the three beat-up Devastators, then spotted the Warhawk bristling with rockets. Cold Justice, the judge's plane. Her hardpoints were laden with rockets, and there were additional racks on top of her wings too. She also had a new modification since Paladin's last aerial encounter with the judge, the cockpit had been extended forward, and a rear gun turret had been welded on her tail. It would be justice to steal that plane. Paladin climbed into the cockpit and hotwired the ignition. Cold Justice's three engines sputtered and turned and roared to life. Tennyson crawled into the rear gunner's seat. Paladin pushed the throttle from idle to one quarter and taxied out of the hangar. A small crowd of armed men were on the runway waiting. This Warhawk had no cannons. Every inch of her frame carried rockets. 
but the mere sight of her turning toward them scattered the guards like leaves. He eased the throttle to half, rolled onto the runway, gathered speed, and rose into the night. Paladin then banked and turned back toward the airport. He dialed the radio to the same frequency that Jack had used on their approach to the island. This is the judge, Paladin said in his best Texan drawl. We got intruders on the ground, boys. Paladin Blake and his security thugs. Thirty, no, maybe forty of them. Better watch your backs. A French-accented voice acknowledged. Paladin kept one eye on the anti-aircraft guns. They remained silent. He pointed cold justice at the row of parked hellhounds on the ground and fired. A dozen rockets whooshed from her wings, snaked through the air, and turned the expensive German planes into fireballs of fuel, bits of glittering shrapnel, and plumes of oily smoke. That would gum up their runway for hours, and limit the number of planes they could get into the air. He pushed the throttle to full, cut the running lights, and pulled back on the stick. Like his lightning girl, this warhawk was just as clumsy, but she did have one advantage over the nimble devastators and furies that protected the island, her 37,000 foot ceiling. If he could climb high enough, fast enough, the smaller planes wouldn't be able to touch them. Cold justice rose through layers of clouds and broke through. Paladin saw stars and the half moon, and as far as he could see, no other planes. Tennyson, get on the radio and raise the Texas Rangers. Ask them to get the Alamo and the Crockett into the air. Then call the relay station in Amarillo and patch through the Hollywood. Have them contact the Aegis in New Orleans and get them here. I want every plane we've got in the air and in Houston in 12 hours. I've got one last thing to handle personally. Then we're going to take care of La Cour de Minuit.